Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Fine Arts Podcast. How are you? I'm doing really well, Owen. Yes, it is a good day to be back and recording. We're answering some questions. We have our monthly Q&A segment, which is always a bit of fun for folks that are watching on YouTube or listening anywhere you may be listening. Maybe you're down a mine shaft or perhaps you're uh, on a run. You can send your questions to us when you're done with that uh, by heading to the link in your show notes. There is a community that we're building up as well, which is wonderful. So we will take questions from our community, but also through the Ask a Question link, which is available in your podcast player. Uh, you can also get in contact with a financial advisor. We're going to answer some questions and we're going to do that in a general advice way. What that means is when you send your question in, we generalize it and we answer the investing concept. But if you want one-on-one -on -one advice, like things that you should do, you should definitely, and you will have to, speak to a licensed and trusted financial planner. There are two easy ways to get a good financial planner. Number one is to head to the moneysmart.gov.au website and find a financial planner. You can see their qualifications and what they can give advice in when you search for a financial advisor. And number two, you can get matched with one of the financial advisors that we have set out. Um, they come to us and we partner with them to give financial advice to the RAS community. Hundreds and hundreds of rascals, dare I say it, Kate, have gone through that process and been matched with a financial planner, whether it's for retirement, pre or post, early stage in life, um, all those different things, you can get matched with a financial planner. Um, so don't forget to send us your questions. You can also leave feedback on Spotify. It is a little bit harder for us to kind of collate everyone's questions from Spotify, but send us your feedback there if you're listening. Otherwise, head to the link in your podcast player uh, and we can get them featured in an upcoming show. So, Kate, what are we talking about to start off? Well, before we jump into the questions, I thought I couldn't think of anything fun to start the conversation with today. So, Given that, the next best thing we should discuss is dividend reinvestment oh, plans. The next <laughs> funny thing and engaging thing, yes. Yes. Well, I mean, if you can't have fun, you can have dividends. Yes. And that's pretty good. Okay. Sometimes you can buy fun with your dividends. Oh, maybe. This is a very tenuous link. But anyway, <laughs> do we reinvest our dividends or not? We get this question a little bit and... I've written an article before that a lot of people have actually read of the reasons why you might reinvest your dividends and the reason why you might not. Okay, give and, us some of those reasons. Well, one of the reasons a lot of people do that is to just have everything on autopilot in the background. So if your ETF pays you some income once, twice, four times a year, if your share pays you some income, that automatically gets reinvested if there's enough to buy another share or a unit, otherwise it's just held and accumulated until it reaches the point where it can purchase another unit. But it all happens in the background and you don't have to think about it. So for a lot of people, that is truly automated investing. Not only are you automatically buying shares and ETFs when balances hit certain amounts, maybe through platforms like Perla, who are a sponsor of the podcast, but the dividends are also automatically reinvested. And so it's fully hands off. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know that in the United States, they don't call them DRPs like we do here in Australia. They've got a fun name for it. They call them DRIPs. And it kind of makes sense. So even though it's a dividend reinvestment plan, it kind of looks like DRIPs in the word, but it also is like drip feeding into mm -hmm. your investment. Um, so a dividend reinvestment plan in a traditional sense was set up when someone bought individual shares, say like BHP, they could log into, say, computer share, and in there, they could select reinvest my dividends. You still pay tax on the dividends because it's still technically income that comes to you. It's just automatically reinvested with no brokerage fee attached because the company effectively just creates the shares for you. Um, then along came ETFs, which have made it really easy to also select a, a drip. They call it a distribution reinvestment plan. So not a dividend reinvestment plan, a distribution, because that's what they're called when they come from ETFs. And the same thing, you go to the share registry, you find the holding, for example, like um, VAS, the Vanguard Australian Shares ETF, uh, you go in to the, the share registry, select reinvest my dividends or my distributions, and the same thing happens again and again and again. So what are some of the reasons why you would not 
do a drip or a dividend reinvestment plan. Some people want more flexibility. They want to choose at which price or when they invest in different ETFs or shares. And so they want to have that cash sitting in a bank account that they can make their own decision with. They don't want it to just automatically happen all the time. So you might not want to keep investing in a particular ETF or share. So maybe you want that money as cash. A lot of people actually use that to live off. A lot Mm -hmm. of our retiree population in Australia actually living off dividends and distributions from ETFs. So they don't want that reinvested. They actually want that cash in their bank account so they can go and pay for their groceries. Mm. Um, And also- A lot of people need to do it too, Kate, by the way. They have uh, pension rules that kick in where they have to withdraw a certain amount from their superannuation, um, a legal requirement, but as they get older, they withdraw more. Uh, And so uh, some people say, I was chatting to my uncle on the weekend, he's in his 70s, he needs to increase the amount that he withdraws from superannuation um, across the board. And so that's something that other people, it's not just a a fascination or a a love affair with income, it's also a legal requirement for older people. But younger people rely on dividends just the same. So um, it would make sense, particularly Mm. with our franking credit system. Yeah, and some companies and ETFs let you choose a full or a partial Mm-hmm. dividend reinvestment plan. So you might choose for 50% to be reinvested and 50% to be put into your bank accounts. So, I mean, sometimes that might help if you're trying to manage putting money aside for tax, because whether it's reinvested or it's in your bank account, you're still paying tax on that. Mm. So you need to make sure that you're putting money aside for that tax bill. Yeah. A few years ago, you and I did an episode on share registries. If you are interested, Google RASC Share Registries, Australian Finance Podcast, or however you might find it. And we did actually a walkthrough of what it looks like to have a share registry account and what you can use it for. And that's oftentimes where you set up the DRIP, the dividend reinvestment plan. Uh, But there's also, I think the question comes down to, Kate, and I'll come back to your opinion in just a second. It comes back to, do you use one? And if so, how? In my opinion, if you're going to do it, you can do it at the brokerage level. I don't have any dividend reinvestment plans turned on. In fact, I don't think I've ever had one turned on because I'd rather just take the cash and then invest it. Um, With our Rask Invest service, there are a few different options. Um, We have an option for people who just want a regular payment every month. So it's like a regular withdrawal amount. But then we have something called an income sweep, which is where the dividends, kind of imagine the dividends that we've invested in things for you and the dividends fall out of it and they hit the ground and then we sweep it all across to you. As they come in, we sweep it over to you and some people select that option. But I think the important point is that um, a lot of people, and we had a great comment, it's surprising that you picked this at the top of the show because in the community, one of the first and most popular posts was dividend reinvestment plans. And um, basically the conclusion amongst the community, in the RAS community at least, it seems to be that you would take the dividends as cash and then reinvest them yourself. Mm. So how how have you done it? Do you use it? Et cetera. I, apart from in my managed funds, I don't use a dividend reinvestment program for my shares and my ETFs just because I like the flexibility. Sometimes I'm reinvesting it. Sometimes it's going towards things I'm saving for. Sometimes I want to invest in something else. So I just like having that flexibility. I like being able to take some of that money aside and put it in my tax account and just really know what's hitting my bank account. I think sometimes I'm a little bit less attached to it if it was reinvested. I wouldn't be able to directly Mm. see that money and understand what I'm building. I remember Matt from Aussie Firebug was talking about that emotional side of dividends, whereas if you had an investment property, you'd receive rental income and you could see that directly. And so with a share portfolio, you can kind of get the same thing by having that cash hit your bank account. And psychologically, you can go, okay, I understand I'm investing in businesses, I'm getting some of the profits and I can use that money for either my living costs or to reinvest it in another thing of my choosing. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I think there is a distinction here that uh, we should make is that you are you and I am me and a lot of people listening to this aren't as interested in finance as yeah. we are and they aren't as hands-on. And so I think for people that uh, aren't as interested Having a DRP set up is a wonderful thing because it's like recurring savings that happen in the background. You kind of use that uh, a behavioral bias, like mental accounting, and it's kind of like, well, the money that I've invested in CBA shares is invested and it's kind of gone until I go back and find it. And some people have treated it like that for a long time. And so CBA pays a dividend, it's reinvested, and you don't even know. You might be paying tax on it, but you don't even know it's slowly compounding in the background. The share price is trickling up 
while also getting more dividends paid. So those can be wonderful in the sense of it can become a compounding machine in the background that works and works and works. But I think if you are a bit more hands-on, having the cash dividends is, like you said, a bit more real, and then you can deploy it into certain things at your own discretion. But it is a horses for courses approach. There are merits to both. Um, and we're not necessarily saying one is right or wrong. Those are just the two options. Mm. I know a lot of people that swear by dividend reinvestment plans and wouldn't do it any other way. So mm. yeah, it's great that you have that flexibility. Yeah, absolutely it is. Okay, first question, Kate. All right, first question has come from Donald Duck oh. and it's about Australian domiciled shares. So we talked recently on another, I think it was a Q&A episode about Australian domiciled ETFs versus US domiciled ETFs. Mm. Now this question is, if you are trying to look for Australian domiciled ETFs for tax purposes, how can you find, if you found something in the US you like, but you want the Australian domiciled version, how can you go about finding equivalent versions? Yeah, sure. I don't so, know if I explained that really complicated. Yeah, no, no that's, that's, that's perfect. So uh, the question is, the question that we did get previously was, uh, shouldn't I just buy the US one? Like if I've got a stake account mm. or a Perla sponsor or a Comsec international account, and I can access US markets, why would I? Not, why don't I just buy an ETF that's on the US exchange, like mm. the New York Stock Exchange? Often because the management fee is a bit lower. It's a, bit more, it's a bit lower. Maybe it's a few extra little points. Um, and I said in that podcast that I would much rather just go with an Australian one um, because in Australia you have a bit of a different regime. And so for folks that aren't aware, when you invest in the United States, there is a tax treaty between the USA and Australia. And basically what it means is that when you invest in the US, there's going to be withholding tax. And they have this for most countries or all countries around the world, as we do. Basically, to make sure that the US government gets their tax revenue, they'll deduct an amount from your investment uh, when you make a profit or some income. Uh, so in order to reduce that withholding amount from 30% to 15%, you have to fill in a tax form called the W8 Ben form. And what that effectively means is that you're an Australian person that is investing in the USA, but there is a tax treaty, so please don't tax me as much. That's basically what that form means. And you have to renew it every few years. Now, what happens when an Australian invests in a US listed ETF is that unless you fill in that form in the United States, there may be extra tax to incur. But there's another thing that happens over there is that you also expose your family to estate taxes, which can be quite brutal. So what ETF providers here in Australia have done is they've effectively created the same ETFs, but with an Australian tax residence. So in this instance, the ETF provider fills out that form on your behalf or effectively on the fund's behalf. And your money goes into the Australian fund and then is invested overseas. And in this way, you don't have to deal with all the admin and the burden of that. It's kind of captured at the fund level, not at the individual level. And so that's what we call an Australian tax domicile. Even though you can have an Australian ETF, some of the fund managers haven't done that. Some of them haven't filled out that form. A good example of this is the VTS ETF from Vanguard. That is not an Australian ETF for tax purposes, even though it's on the Australian Stock Exchange. There, fortunately, there aren't many of these left. Um, that's the most notable example, but there are others. And the way to find this out is to go to their website and to see where it says tax domicile. Um, this is a big reason why we use the IVV ETF in our Rask Invest portfolios and not the VTS ETF. There are some slight differences, but basically, if you're looking for an ETF that might do a similar thing, you have a few options. Um, you can just go to the big providers and see what's available on their website. You can use the ASX monthly ETP report. This is a report that comes out every month and it breaks out the ETFs into different sectors and you can see what they do. Um, you can use a third-party website like Morningstar or something like that. Or finally, and this is a bit technical, but it's the best way to understand how to do it, is if you find an index, so let's say like the S&P 500, that is not owned by Vanguard, it's not owned by iShares, it's not owned by BetaShares, sponsor of the show. So what you can do, you can find out who owns that index. In this case, it's the S&P 500, so it's the Standard & Poor's Index. So you go to Standard & Poor's website, you click on the S&P 500, and what it has underneath that is a list of all of the different ETFs around the world that use that index. So you could go and you could find, oh, there's a US one. Oh, there's an Australian one. And so you can go and you can find all of the different ETFs that track that particular index. And 
a lot of the times, all you need to know is that most of the, the, the major markets are covered here in Australia, so you don't need to look abroad. And that's how we be- build our portfolios. Um, it's a bit geeky to get into the weeds in that question, but the reality is you don't need to, unless you're going to something really exotic, which is probably not that important to you, um, you're better off just sticking with Aussie listed ETFs. Mm. I would say you could find every core ETF you need on the ASX. Oh, easy. It's, easy. it's often those sort of really niche thematics that might hit a certain group of values or there's certain religious ETFs that exist in the US that might not exist in Australia. Yeah, yeah. We, we have got a couple of them coming. There are a couple of like religious super funds uh, and I wouldn't be surprised to see them launch in the next five years here in Australia uh, because people do have those values and they do want to invest accordingly. Hmm. All right. The next question is from Muggs. M-U-G-Z. Yeah, I guess that's how to say it. What is quality investing and do you see this being part of an ETF portfolio? Should quality be included in a portfolio's core and how would that be incorporated? So the two most popular ETFs that our community would be familiar with is the QLTY from BetaShares, Disclosure, as I said, sponsor of the show, um, and the QUAL ETF from VanEck, which is the biggest one. So what is quality investing? Basically, it seems like it's almost like what kind mm. of moment where you're like, that's a like that that's a thing that doesn't, you have to define. Doesn't everyone just get invested in good quality companies? Yeah, it's kind of like uh, what what are you talking about? So a quality company is a company that, based on uh, statistical factors like what we call fundamental factors, it would be a company that exhibits values that we would associate with quality, and so. Assume that you have a company, you would want to, one, make sure it's growing. That seems like a high quality company would be growing. Uh, It would probably have good profits, so wide profit margins. It would probably have no debt because debt is often a bad thing when there's a lot of it. And so you're looking for these types of what we call factors in a company. And so we can screen, thanks to the big financial databases, we can screen the internet and we can go, how many companies meet the criteria of having these values. Uh, and so if we got wide profit margins, we've got low debt, uh, we've got you know increasing sales or something like that, then we can run some calculations and put all those together in a list. We can say, assuming that companies meet all of these criteria, let's put them in a basket and make that an ETF. And that's effectively what the Qual ETF does from Banek, which is the biggest one. Uh, the thing is, this is what we call a factor ETF because it's focused on one factor, which is the quality factor. We're trying to find which companies exhibit those tendencies. And if you think about it, um, Warren Buffett is an example of a quality investor because he owns companies that have really strong brands, like he's the biggest investor in the world in Apple, Coca-Cola, American Express. All of these companies have really strong brands and really strong businesses. And so he's in effect a quality investor. People think he's a value investor, but they're kind of joined at the hip because if you're a long-term investor, you want quality in your portfolio because those businesses will do better mm. over time, right? So that's the answer to that question. Um, you can do it at the stock level or you can do it at the ETF level. Now, um, we don't have qu- quality in our portfolios at RASC in like an explicit way. So we don't have the qual ETF just parked in the portfolio. And the reason is that that ETF comes with a higher fee. And for our core portfolio, there is also a significant amount of overlap. So what happens is the Qual ETF has about 300 companies in it. And I don't know exactly the companies at the time of recording, but you might have, say, Apple in there because it's pretty high quality, Google. You might have these types of companies in there, right? But you also have them in the S&P 500, which we've got in our portfolio. So a normal broad market ETF, like one that captures the entire market, tends to have quality companies in there because the quality companies tend to perform well, so they rise to the top. Mm. And so you've got to be careful when you add this to your core portfolio, how much overlap there is. Uh, And you can test that using tools like the Vanguard one. Uh, We also have a a fund comparison tool. Um, And basically you want to make sure that you're not just doubling up on the same thing you already have. Uh, Or if you are doing it, you're making a conscious decision to do that. I think the Qual ETF is a wonderful ETF and I think it could go in the satellite portion of someone's portfolio. It could also go in the core portfolio. Uh, Just be aware of the overlap is what I would say. And you can check that on the ETF provider's website. All right. The next question from KC, and that is not from me. 
I was wondering if you guys could talk about how to account for tax when investing. So when I put my numbers into a compound interest calculator, how much of this will I actually be able to keep? So mm. people might be thinking about this after that dividend reinvestment question of if I'm getting $1,000 in income, yeah. how much of that do I need to think about putting aside for tax? Because yeah. my job does it for me but I haven't really figured out how I do this with my investments. It's a good question. Um, KC, maybe, you know, the internet version of Kate Campbell. Who knows? <laughs> um, basically, uh, KC, in this instance, it's it's a very tricky question, but it's a very interesting one that you've latched onto because most people, when they go to a compound interest calculator, they put in their savings rate, their annual return, and then they see what happens with the chart. There are two very important things that come out of that ultimate return. One is the tax and the other one is inflation. Most people don't really think about inflation and they are buying a cup of coffee for $17 in five years and they're like, oh, I don't feel that wealthy. It's because everything's gone up in price, even though your net worth has gone up too. We'll disregard that for the purposes of today's show and we'll just focus on the tax element. One of the things that's often missed in investing is your after-tax return. And if you invest in an ETF or you invest in a stock or you invest in a property, you will know that none of them tell you what your after-tax return is. It's because they don't know what your income tax rate is. Um, an ETF does do you a big favor more so than any of the others is they send you a tax report at the end of the year, typically around late July or August, say, um, and you can see your taxable numbers, but you don't know until the end of the year. So it's a bit of a black box. It's a bit of a mystery. So what obviously we want to do is we want to minimize the amount of tax we're paying. So there are two things that you should focus on. The first thing is you should focus on making sure that you're getting some franking credits. Franking credits, as you know, Kate, are tax offsets. So they effectively, if you earn income and you are due to pay tax, they can offset some of that. And if you're in retirement or you have excess franking credits, they can be refunded to you, which is a wonderful thing. Now, normally what happens is most people earn an income uh, through their investments and the franking credits only offset a portion of it, not enough, because you only earn franking credits on Australian investments uh, and in companies, not in property or anything like that. So that's the first thing to keep in mind is when you minimize your taxes, you can use tax effective investments like that. The second thing is how you invest for the capital growth. A lot of people don't truly appreciate this because once again, it's not as easily seen in the numbers is if you are constantly buying and selling, you will pay more tax and you will also pay more fees because every time you sell for a gain, you are due a tax liability. So you sell, you buy for 10, you sell for 20, it's a $10 gain, you will pay tax on that gain. Now, the longer you invest, i.e. after 12 months, uh, there is a discount on that amount of tax that you will pay. But imagine, for example, Kate, that someone buys an investment and they're not selling it and they don't sell it for like 20 or 30 years. Wouldn't that be nice? Because effectively, you're just saying to future you, figure this out in the future. An index fund ETF, a broad-based ETF, has so many advantages in this regard because typically it is super diversified. So what that means is that even though there's buying and selling happening inside of the ETF, typically they're not constantly buying the biggest positions. They're not selling a lot of positions. It's just a, you know, the 299 and number 300 in an ASX 300 ETF that is then pushed out of the portfolio and a new one comes in. Or maybe there's a takeover inside there of the ASX 50th you know, company and it causes tax to eventually come back. But my point is this, if you focus on an ETF that is broad-based and low cost and not really one of those sexy ones with all these different fancy rules and stuff, your taxable amount will be lower because inside of the ETF, there are fewer things happening. And that means that there's fewer, fewer taxable events. And so when you look at the return of like a compound interest calculator, think to yourself, how can I make sure that I'm not, like, there's not a lot of slippage here? One, get those franking credits. Number two, make sure you're a long-term investor who's focusing on something that is broad-based and low cost um, because those will make sure that the actual amount that you have to allocate for tax every year is less. Um, another thing that I'll quickly touch on here is there's no exact formula for how much you should put aside, but your accountant will be able to help you with this. And so one of the things that you can do is just before the end of the financial year, so like May every year, um, the tax year ends on June 30th, Start to think to yourself, 
do I have any taxable losses? Do I have any taxable gains? Should I make decisions this financial year so I can incur the tax loss now? Obviously, there are rules around that, so be careful. Um, but then if you are going to reset your portfolio next year, start thinking about that a month or two ahead of time so that then next year's taxable burden isn't as much. Um, and that's basically all we can do. Fortunately, a lot of us, when we do get a tax bill, Kate, we pay out our savings and we don't have to sell our investments. Mm. But some people do make the mistake of selling a position for a big capital gain and have no way to pay the tax bill. So they end up having to sell another investment to fund that investment and it creates this domino effect. But most of us, if we set it up right, we invest accordingly, we don't need to do that. We can just pay the tax bill out of our savings, then get the refund, the tax refund, which would likely come or neutralize, and then just have a little bit of money left over. But that's the sh that's the long answer to that very important question. Mm. Something I did the other year was actually pay my accountant a bit extra to have a bit of a planning session of just what, given my income and given everything that I'm doing, what do I need to put aside? Now, they can't give you exact figures, but they can have a bit more of an educated estimation of based off what you did mm. in the last year, this is what you're likely to pay for tax. And so mm. that means I could go in with a little bit more of an educated idea of what I needed to put aside. Absolutely, you can. And uh, if you've got an experience last year or the year before, you can do that. You can use portfolio tracking tools like Nevexa uh, or ShareSite. We have uh, a discount for Nevexa for anyone that's interested. You can uh, check out the link in your show notes. Um, we don't get anything from it, just as an FYI. And it helps you track your portfolio for tax. But one of the things that it helps you do is it helps you track your income and your franking credits. It also helps you track your current gain. So if you were to sell, what would be the implication on your tax affairs? Uh, and that's really important for people that may have an expense coming up, like an overseas holiday. Maybe they've got it, they want to buy a house, whatever the case. A lot of people at the moment, Kate, who are investing with us, they have big portfolios already. So right now is a really interesting time for us to be recording because people are actively thinking, I want to invest with the RAS team but I've got all these taxable gains and losses and things I need to sort out. And so they need some way of understanding, well, what is my taxable position and which one should I sell now in order to make that investment that I want to make over there? Um, and just having a clear picture of that, you can get that through one of those pieces of software. Mm, yeah. I personally use ShareSide and it makes life a lot easier. Definitely. Even a spreadsheet. Like if you if it's simple enough, you can use a spreadsheet, but you're better off using one of the tools um, because it's just, it makes it easy. Yeah. yeah, they're good. Their uh, capital gain reports and yeah. future income reports and all of that's very helpful for me yeah, personally. Absolutely. Um, do you think we have time for one more question? I think we do. All right. I might talk about the one from Belinda. Absolutely. This question's from Belinda. She was wondering if the holdings in an ETF can change over time. So you've mentioned rebalancing just before and how some of the positions might change. She asked, for example, if one company folds or another emerges on the S&P 500, can they be added or removed from an ETF to be competitive? I've not been able to find this online. It's a great question, Belinda. Uh, really good question. So I wrote a post for our members going back quite a while ago now. I can't remember how long ago it was. But I basically, the, the title of the article that I wrote was called Hunting for Anti-Fragile Companies or Hunting for Anti-Fragile Investments. And um, I later, well, recently I shared that update in the RAS community, which you'll find in your show notes. So go, go and check this out because there was quite a few opinions of this. And basically what I was trying to find is an investment that I could hold for 20 or 30 years and be confident that it would still be around in 20 or 30 years. And th the reason I wrote this article was because p someone put it to me. They challenged me on uh, Twitter, of all places, to say, if you could only invest for 20 years, what would you buy? And a lot of people in that uh, thread on Twitter had opinions like, I would buy a tech stock, or I would buy this thing, or I would buy that thing. And I kind of took this in the opposite way. I thought, well, I would do what Warren Buffett always says that he does, and he tries to find things that don't change. So he tries to find companies that don't change. Like Coca-Cola has been around for over 100 years. Um, Berkshire Hathaway, which is a textile business, has been around for decades. That's the name of Berkshire, his investment company. American Express has been around for decades, right? These types of businesses. But wouldn't it be nice if there was something that you were certain would still be here in 20 years, but could also adapt to what the world is doing? 
So it's kind of like this anti-fragile thing where it's it's going to be there, but it will evolve kind of like evolution, right? It's, it's adjusting to the world around it. And an index fund is actually like an ETF, a broad-based ETF is one of the best things that I can possibly think of. The reason is exactly what Belinda was talking about. If a company is taken over and removed from their stock market, say the S&P 500, like the top 500 companies, it will be replaced. Likewise, let's say there's a company in there that's not performing well at all, and the other 499 are performing really well. What happens is, relatively speaking, the others zoom ahead of that one in the list of the top companies, and that one falls down the list until it gets to number 500, in which case then it starts to keep falling, and it's replaced by number 501, and then you have a new S&P 500 that day. These are called rebalancing dates or index rebalancing dates, and they're very common depending on the index. It can be quarterly, it can be whatever, and typically based on size. To bring this illustration home for you, Belinda, and for everyone else that's listening, in the year 1900, the S&P 500, which is the US stock market, was dominated by railroads. By the year 2000, you had a bunch of different energy companies like Exxon and these types of petroleum companies, but also the likes of Microsoft, Apple was zooming up the ranks and these types of businesses, because in the year 2000, some of you may remember, that was the year of the dot-com boom. S- subsequently, there was a dot-com bust, but we won't talk about that for now. <laughs> Fast forward another 24 years to now, and we know, like, I challenge anyone, as I say this, to name it within three seconds, the biggest railroad in the S&P 500. I'll wait. No one would guess what the biggest railroad is. Do you know? No. I do not know what the biggest <laughs> railroad is, right? Is there one? <laughs> But we all know the names of Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, NVIDIA, these Mm. types of businesses. It's the same S&P 500 from the year 1900, but with totally different companies inside it. And that's what makes it anti-fragile. The fact that it can evolve based on this very rudimentary system of just the biggest companies go in, the little ones go out. And we know the big ones tend to get bigger until they reach a point, like the railroads did when they were kind of usurped by like road transport and they kind of reach maturity. And then the technology wave came in. And who knows what the next 50 years will hold. But if I go back to that original um, punt that someone took asked me to take, I would invest in one of those because as long as we still have I- indices or indexes, we will still have companies in there and they will be evolving. And an ETF is the best way to capture that at the moment. So that's the answer to the question. Yes, they change. And yes, they change for the better. Hmm. I think that's a good conclusion for the show and it sort of pulls together all of the questions. We've been receiving a lot of questions about ETFs Mm -hmm. investing recently on. Yes, we have. Well, a lot. We've been doing a lot of live shows. The YouTube channel has been going absolutely ballistic from both sides with more content being added each and every day from not just us, but the other hosts of the podcasts and um, we've got shorts and all those types of things on there. So people are just like swarming around the YouTube channel at the same time when heaps of people are finding us um, on the video mediums and we've been talking about through webinars and that type of a thing. So if you haven't already, the two things I would go and check out are the YouTube channel and also the community where you can actually ask your questions and get feedback from financial advisors or other people in the community. And if you're new to ETFs, I shared this with one of our investors the other day uh, for his wife who's not interested in finance. Uh, He asked for any content on ETFs to help people understand. And you will remember with Monique, we sat down and we did the ETF investing mini series where we took it back to basics. We're in this very studio. Um, That's available as a playlist on YouTube and it's probably the most popular over the past 12 to 24 months. And it's fully available and it's free with all the resources on how to research your own ETFs, including tax domicile. So go and check that out. It's a completely free resource. Uh, We'd love to hear from you over there on YouTube. But Kate, it's good Q&A. Can't wait to get next week's uh, next month's questions. So send them all in. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more.